Come on now. Yes, now we see it. Okay, yes. thank you. So uh, our last talk in this session today uh, is by Luke Finnerty from UCLA, graduate student. Um, and Luke will be presenting on a result using KPIC to do emission spectroscopy of WASP 33B. So take it away, Luke. Yeah, um, so following up on Jerry's talk, I'm gonna do a deep dive into some KPIC phase one science. Um, and so KPIC was originally kind of intended for directly imaged exoplanets. And so it uses single mode fibers because these offer really effective suppression of the speckle field in the background compared with the slit system. There are some side benefits though, in terms of the blaze and line spread function stability from the fiber injection unit. And those have been shown to really reduce systematics associated with cross-correlation based detection techniques for close in planets. So we decided to see what we could get with KPIC um, from this increase in stability. And we decided to start with an ultra hot Jupiter uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they're bright, so they're easier to detect. Uh, but two is that hot Jupiters or ultra hot Jupiters specifically are very interesting uh, for their own sake. So their atmospheres have um, a lot of complexity to them. On the day side, they have thermal inversions. So the temperature actually increases as you go to lower pressure, higher in the atmosphere. This isn't true on the night side, which may be cloudy. And then in addition to that, because they're so close to their stars, they are expected to have significant non-equilibrium chemistry, uh, day side dissociation of molecules, even ionization in some cases. And all of these effects are interesting, but they're very difficult to model. And so what we wanted to do was approach this with kind of a free retrieval, see if we can look at the day side, look at the night side, and make as few model assumptions as possible so that we can then compare what we get to these global circulation models. And so the technique that we use to do this is called high resolution cross correlation spectroscopy. The idea is that you treat the star exoplanet system as a super high contrast spectroscopic binary. And because hot Jupiters have orbital periods of just a few days, if you observe for a night or a half night, the radial velocity of that exoplanet uh, will change by tens of kilometers per second just because the planet is orbiting at the star. And so what that means is that lines associated with the planet will trace out this sinusoidal pattern. But over a couple of hours, telluric stellar features don't change that much. And so those are flat. And so if you take a long sequence, say from here to here, you can divide out effectively the star and the Earth's atmosphere, and then look for features that show this variation. The signal and noise on these features isn't great, but we can combine them with a cross-correlation function and then make a good detection. There are a couple of benefits to this over doing transit characterization. Um, one is that you don't actually need a transit, so you have uh, more flexibility in targets. And two is that you're more flexible in your pressure range probe and the longitude range probe. You're not just looking at the atmospheric scale height near the terminators, you can look at the day side, you can look at the night side, you can look in between and start to get a sense of the 3D structure of these exoplanets directly. So we decided to start with the WASP-33 system. It's an archetypal hot Jupiter, uh, 1.2 day polar orbit. Uh, we observed for two nights. Uh, so one, we observed pre-transit and then we got a full transit and stuck around post-transit. So this is looking here and here at the night side emission spectrum of the planet. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the transiting data because it's a little more complicated to analyze, and so we left that for later. And then about a month later, we reobserved, looking just after secondary eclipse at the day side spectrum of the exoplanet. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that uh, WASP-33 is a delta scuti pulsator. Uh, this is a problem if you're doing this in optical because you're looking at lines that are both in the star and in the planet. It's less of a problem in the IR because we're looking... Uh, specifically at CO and water, which we don't expect to be seeing in an A-type star. So the pulsation becomes a photometric effect and it's a bit easier to calibrate. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, some problems sometimes show up when you have a new instrument. Uh, so we have our raw data here. We hope that we could scale it and divide it, get a nice flat, you know, clean, non-varying spectrum or spectral time series. And instead we have this kind of nasty time varying fringing uh, signal. We have figured out what's caused this. There is a, a workaround if you're doing on axis science in Shaq Hartman mode in phase two. Um, but fortunately this is really effectively removed through principal component analysis. When you do that, you have to be careful that you're not accidentally distorting the planet signal. And so we take a negative injection approach where we subtract the proposed planet model, then do the PCA, then add the planet model back. If the planet model is well matched, you don't have to worry about the self-subtraction, but this takes way longer to compute. 
Uh, so we can look first at just the cross correlation function and get kind of a qualitative sense of what's going on in this atmosphere. So we have our day side observations in the left column, night side in the right column, and then each row is different molecules. And each of these postage stamps, we have the systemic velocity on the y-axis and the planet RV semi-amplitude on the x-axis. And we expect to see the planet at zero, zero here. And so we see that we make detections of both day side and night side, and in both cases, we're completely dominated by 12 CO. There are weak features from 13 CO and water that are kind of coincident with the expected planet velocities, but they aren't clear independent detections. Uh, the other thing that we see is there's a nine kilometer per second offset between the day side and the night side. Um, it's a little hard just from two epochs of emission data to distinguish between say a 3D effect where one limb is dominating the day side and this is mostly rotation versus day to night winds. But when we combine this with uh, transit data near the terminators, we can really start to get a sense of the 3D circulation on this planet directly. Uh, so to make some more quantitative measurements, we threw this into a retrieval setup. We use Petit Radtrans, which lets us do uh, very quick radiative transfer models for the planet. Uh, the Brogy and Line 2019 paper provides a way to get a log likelihood function from a cross correlation. And then once you have that, you have the full set of uh, Bayesian statistics tools. We're using the Dynasty implementation for nested sampling. We did try an MC run and it gives the same results, but it takes way longer. So sticking with nested sampling. Uh, so looking first at the thermal structure that we get for the day side. Uh, so this shows the pressure temperature profile, how the temperature of the atmosphere varies as you go higher up to lower pressures. We see that there is a thermal inversion as expected. And so the lines show up in emission. Uh, but this profile is running a little bit colder than we expected. We think that this is because we only observed a pretty narrow range of the K-band that's shaded in gray here. And so over such a narrow range, the line strength winds up being set more by the temperature contrast, so the difference in temperature from here to here, rather than the absolute temperature. Um, the other thing that we can look at is the emission contribution function. So where in the atmosphere is this light coming from? So that's this plot here. And we see that most of our emission is coming from a band relatively deep in the atmosphere between 1 and 0.1 bars, with some contribution uh, in the CO line course from lower pressures, but compared with, say, optical data, we are actually looking very deep in the planet's atmosphere here. Uh, so we can compare this with the night side. Uh, here we get a non-inverted profile. It's running a little bit hotter than expected, but the thermal contrast is actually lower, and so the um, amplitude of these lines relative to the continuum is actually a little bit lower. Uh, but it's a very similar story when we think about the emission contribution, where we're really probing this kind of deep band in the atmosphere. So we can talk not just about thermal structure, but about abundances. Thankfully, these are uncorrelated, so we get robust uh, abundance constraints despite uncertainties in the PT profile. Uh, but unfortunately, those constraints aren't great. We only constrain within about an order of magnitude, but these constraints are very strongly covariant. So whenever we see more CO, we're also seeing more water. This high resolution technique loses continuum information. So you get good information on the ratio of species, not as much on the absolute abundances. So what this means is that we can place a very robust constraint on the C to O ratio, uh, which is about one. And the other interesting thing is that we don't see a statistically significant variation in the water abundance between day side and night side, even though we expected there maybe could be one uh, because there's been a previous detection uh, in H-band data of OH on the day side, which we think comes from that dissociation. So either that dissociation is very confined longitudinally, or we are looking deeper in the atmosphere below that dissociation. We can then take uh, our retrieved abundances. So we have water in blue here, see the, the wide error, and CO in green. And we can compare that with equilibrium chemistry models included in Petit Radtrans. So we start with our retrieve parameters and then just iteratively vary metallicity and C to O uh, until we get a set of parameters that seems to match our retrieval well in this pressure range we're most sensitive to. And when we do that, I have the day side up here, the night side up here, and this is now showing the molecules that we missed, no solubly silicon oxide. Uh, we find that the C to O ratio drops a little bit, but it's still high. It's about 0.9, and that's because of this silicon oxide, uh, which we might be able to detect in L band. Um, and we find that both day side and night side are slightly metal rich, although that's not really statistically robust. Uh, but it's interesting because it means 
this, this high metallicity, high CO ratio combination, if the high metallicity holds up, uh, really starts to let us constrain where and how this planet formed. Uh, specifically, that may be an indicator of formation near the CO2 snow line. So now that we've demonstrated um, that this works, there's actually a bunch of other targets that we could do. There's about 40 targets that we think can be characterized using this technique uh, and current KPIC performance. Uh, and this opens up some really interesting possibilities. We can get a large sample of hot Jupiter atmospheres. We can start to do uh, uniform comparisons across the whole population and start to understand, okay, how do these planets form? Are there multiple formation pathways? Do those formation pathways need different chemical signatures? And then beyond that, how are these planets evolving? And do we see trends in the evolution based on mass, spectral type, and so on? Uh, and so we've actually started to do this with KPIC phase two. Uh, this is data we took in July and August, and we now have pretty uh, well-developed tools that let us analyze this data quickly. So we made strong detections of 51 Pegasi B, HC189733 B. 209458, we had some weather problems. Uh, so that's a little bit sketchier. Uh, Kelt 9B, which is another ultra hot Jupiter, we detect the night side, although there's some systematics we're tracing down. And then we're really trying to get this working in L band uh, because we think that would be particularly effective for cooler planets. Uh, so this is a single order, um, but it shows a feature at the expected planet velocity, although there's a bunch of other junk here. So we're hopeful that as we figure out how to better calibrate our L-band data, use more of these orders, uh, we'll be able to do this in L-band as well. And this is really complementary to what's happening with JWST because we're looking at, we can look at different targets, different longitudinal ranges, uh, and we're less affected by clouds. So when we have JWST data, it's great. You can get more on the 3D circulation, but it's, it's complementary. So I will uh, leave my summary and future work slide up and uh, take any questions, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? I don't yet see any in the Slack channel. I, I don't see any hands in the room. I, can you just go back one slide? I don't understand what I'm looking at. Ah, sorry. So this shows the systemic velocity offset from the literature value, and this shows the planet RV semi amplitude. So we expect to see a feature near zero, zero, um, there can be, there's a degeneracy because this is a semi-amplitude and we're only fitting a small portion of the overall phase. Um, so that's why you get this degeneracy. And then there can be offsets um, probably due to winds or 3D circulation. But the, the strikes are the same as the So the strikes are um, a degeneracy between this um, between the, the planet velocity parameter and the systemic velocity. So the, the model is KP sine phase plus the cis. Um, and because the sine phase is, it's not a whole orbit, it's only a portion. Um, so you can get, you know, a shift in the velocity semi-amplitude um, is kind of a, a linear shift with a little bit of variation. Um, if you're looking at say a small phase range, um, so there's a, a degeneracy between the two. Okay, I'm just surprised we don't know the system. And then Bruce has his hand up in the room here, Joshua. Yeah. Okay, uh, go ahead, Bruce. Sorry, go ahead. Um, Other oh, um, so naive question because I don't do extra planets. But um, is the CO snow like uh, CO snow line where you would expect more hot Jupiter, or are there other snow lines you'd expect? Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is do we expect hot Jupiters to form near the CO snow line, or do we expect them to form near others? Um, I don't think that's particularly well constrained. We don't expect hot Jupiters generally formed where we see them, especially these ultra hot Jupiters on inclined orbits. But you know, does it migrate from the water snow line, the CO2 snow line further out? You know, how far out in the disk I don't think is as well uh, constrained. I guess just to continue to interpret these figures, the black circles represent kind of the the, the best fit of the distribution. Yeah, so this is the best fit of this. Um, and because so, so the, the offsets you see here are larger than the physical offsets because this is a semi-amplitude. So the sign 
argue, the argument of the sine function here is small. Um, and so what this means is that um, this offset looks like it's you know 10 kilometers per second. It's actually more like three or four. And then we can start to get into a regime where we have to consider winds, we have to consider rotation because all of those can produce similar offsets. And those offsets can vary over the orbital period on the same frequency. Um, and so that starts to make this semi-amplitude even a little bit more complicated. I mean, like, like you know, to, to Lynn's comment, you, know, you do know the system velocity and the tension between the intersections of the system velocity and the, and the data points, like you say, it's telling you something about the planetary atmosphere winds, for example. Right. Right. And then Joshua, it looks like we've run out of time. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks to our four speakers in the session for very, very nice presentations with some exciting results.